You know, if you tuned into SmackDown this week, you would be totally and completely forgiven if you were all types of confused. Like, if it was the first time you had in a while tuned in to watch, you would be forgiven for wondering what's going on. Because you wouldn't know how to handle it. You'd say, but this show is actually good. Is Vince not in charge anymore? Is Vince not overseeing the creative for SmackDown? Like, what's going on here? Especially if you tune in each week and you watch Raw. I only use the show longer. It's so many more times horrible. And it doesn't even make any sense. And you look at those shows and you say, how do we get to this point where Raw is so infinitely worse than SmackDown? I know, it's insane. So you'd be forgiven for being confused. Because my God, SmackDown was really, really good this week. And there's been this little run here, kind of post-SummerSlam, where SmackDown, more weeks than not, to me at least, has really, really delivered. Uh, now, this was a season premiere episode. I don't know how you have a season premiere when you never have an off-season, but marketing gimmicks and tricks and all of that stuff, blah, 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 blah. But basically, you kick off the show with God and Stephanie. Oh, God. In the ring, girl. Because I guess we have to talk about who's now on the SmackDown roster. You know, we, we saw you, though, Hunter, talking about Super Freak, and you got... You got your wife sitting there talking about Rick James. No, you're talking about Lars Sullivan. We see you, Hunter. We see how you work your magic. But, you know, the whole thing here is it's like you're introducing a few people and then just this random feeling type of brawl breaks out to ultimately set up some shine and some spotlight for Lars Sullivan. And it's like now you're going to be really forcing him down people's throats like he's going to be the really big deal that they're going to get behind, like, at least I could get it with Braun. You know, because Braun is a super heavyweight. You know, Braun is a great athlete for that size. You know, Braun on a good day can at least be some type of character and some type of personality. I don't see any of those traits or elements with Lars Sullivan, so it's just a little surprising to me and a little interesting that they're going to basically try to make him uh, their new Braun Strowman. And it, it, just, it just doesn't work. But nonetheless, they did, which transitions right into the Lars Sullivan versus Jeff Hardy match. Again, you know, obviously trying to give Lars Sullivan a big spotlight, a big shine here. And this feels more like a Vladimir Kozlov type of situation than it does a Braun Strowman situation. And I imagine there are plenty of you that probably will feel somewhat similarly to what I just said. Now, Kozlov got quite a run back in the day, if you remember. But eventually, once he lost, it all went downhill very, very quickly. And I would anticipate that this push would eventually fall by the wayside all the same. A notable thing that happened on this show was kind of what you would classify as New Day Swan Song. And I gotta tell you, for that promo that they did before their match, like, you could you could sense the feels, you could sense the emotions, like not every wrestling promo in order to be good has to be incredibly entertaining or funny or witty or intense or anything like that. Sometimes real is best. And this was really real. Now, obviously, you have a lot of fans that are disappointed that the New Day are splitting up and they're mad about it and they got feelings about it. It just kind of speaks to the emotional connection that many fans of WWE, many fans of SmackDown have towards the New Day. But... If you stay around as the hero too long, eventually you stay around long enough to see yourself become the villain. It is much better for these guys to break off now. It is much better for them to go their own way. You can always come back to it if you need to. You can always do it again. You can always run it back, as they would say. Uh, but, the, but the timing is right. And for those that are saying, well... I don't want to see Big E's personality totally change. I'd agree. I don't need to see him totally change. But you need to see a little bit more seriousness out of him if you want to make him into a main event star. Like doing what he did in a tag team faction type of role is one thing, and it can work really well there. But you go from that and carrying like one segment of the company to potentially being a guy that you want envisioned that could carry the entire company, the perspective must change. 
period. The attitude must change, period. The mindset must change, period. The approach, everything must change. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to change dramatically, but there has to be a little bit of change. And if you don't, then he's going to fail. I get you don't want him to go all the way super serious, and I get that. Let some of his natural personality traits and character elements show through. And I still want to see that as well, but it's time. So I understand, and you guys can chime in with your favorite New Day memories in the comment section to this video, but it was time, and people need to accept that. And at least we didn't have to see them actually split off in terms of doing some type of somebody turns on somebody. Like, we could do it and they all remain cool, and I'm okay with that. But I do have one question. Why did Otis feel the need to savagely attack Sami Zayn? All Sami Zayn was doing was speaking to the truth. He was speaking facts. Like, I realize in this world we don't care about the facts anymore. We just care about everybody's feelings. But the facts are what the facts are. And Mandy Rose, Otis's girlfriend, is off on Raw. Tucker is now off on Raw. Otis is there on his own. Like, Sammy didn't say anything that wasn't anything other than the honest truth. And there is Otis, the number three babyface of SmackDown, attacking Sammy Zayn, the clearly established number two babyface of SmackDown. I don't get it. I don't get it. It's just a crazy, crazy 2020. That's what I have to attribute it to. Otis just had a bad, bad day. But for a lot of you... From the average fan to the neck beard to the moving match marks, certainly a big moment for you was the return of Daniel Bryan. Oh yes! Oh yes! Oh yes! And I would say, like, it was cool to see him back in a WWE ring. It's cool to see him in the Thunderdome. And I can imagine there's somebody out there that was very excited about the possibility of there being a Daniel Bryan versus Seth Rollins for you to thinking that's what's actually going to happen, but we know. Now that, that, that's not ultimately where we're going at this point. <coughs> Excuse me, because Seth is on SmackDown. So are Ray and Dominic and the whole Mysterio family. And, you know, we're going to see this now on SmackDown. I guess you're, you're assuming some new fans get to watch it, so it's going to carry on for a little bit. It is what it is. A nice little play there at the end, though, as they, as they brawl and Seth tries to do something. And, you know, I like the way that they revealed the Mysterio family coming out as... Seth was trying to get away from Daniel Bryan, and then he's kind of forced back into the ring. I also like what they did with Buddy Murphy here when he comes out. But more importantly, you know, at the end, he's trying to get Ray to shake his hand. You know, he's trying to say, am I invited to Thanksgiving and Christmas, Dad? Some of you savage fucks are probably going to say, can you tell me what Aaliyah smells like, Ray? <laughs> but... He's just trying to join the family like he got feelings for Aaliyah. Can you blame him? I mean, so, you know, it is what it is. Uh, the Street Profits defend their titles. Like, personally, I'm more geeked out about seeing video packages involving Bianca Belair. Like, I, I saw a few people tweeting about during the show that they want to see more about her wrestling. No. Like, stop being damn wrestling move match marks. You're trying to build a character. You're trying to build a personality. You're trying to establish an identity. It's not always about the moves in the matches, you idiots. Stop it. You're trying to make her the EST of WWE, the EST of women's wrestling in WWE and on SmackDown, then this is the right approach to take. Uh, Sasha and Bayley's contract signing, I actually like this segment a lot more than I had some of the previous ones. I thought Sasha looked absolutely fantastic in her kind of glittery, shiny uh, cat suit. Uh, Bailey looked cool, but you know Sasha, I thought looked outstanding. Like that look kind of really works well for her. Um, but I thought she came across better here. I thought Bailey came across well. I thought she came across better here. Like now Sasha's got a little bit more of an edge. You know, there's a little bit more of attitude that's showing. You know, you're trying to sell her as a legit boss. Now she's acting a little more legit boss. I like the fact that you went through and Bailey didn't sign the contract. Like, not everything requires an immediate payoff. Not everything has to happen right away. I just thought the dynamics between the two of them worked better this time. I thought the promo work was better this time. I just thought the set, the segment was much more well-constructed than some of the things we have seen previously. And I am certainly here for that. But let's be clear here and let's be real here. The only thing that matters is the main event, the universal title match. Roman Reigns, Braun Strowman, let's get it on!
my goodness. Roman, just absolutely majestic. You know, Braun put up a game, brave fight. Sure, he was game to the challenge. Uh, but you could be the monster among men. But on the pecking order, that falls way, way below the tribal chief. Way below. Don't ever get that twisted. And a little markout moment for me, as Goldberg was teasing that he was going to be in the Thunderdome, uh, a lot of fans, you know, thought apparently that that meant he was actually physically going to be there. They were crying about that. And instead, now that wasn't the case at all. He was just literally part of the Thunderdome crowd, as was Mark Henry. And I know the other name you're going to say. I'm not even going to engage in it. You want to see that? You go watch the Bound for Glory 2010 review. You're not getting it twice in a week. You will not. I refuse. I don't care if he breaks another 10,000 guitars and doesn't draw any dimes. Right now, no. It's not time for that. It distracts away from what really matters, which is our hero, the true number one babyface of WWE, and that is, of course, the tribal chief, Roman Reigns. And even here, like, he goes on, and I love the fact that Roman's got a submission move, a submission finish now. It adds layers and depth to him, and I think that makes him look even more badass than just the standard kind of Superman punch spear type of finish. Like, he choked out Braun Strowman. Like, that's not a small thing. That's a big freaking deal. It just kind of shows you how invested the company is right now in this Roman Reigns character, as they should be. But leave it to family to screw everything up. As Roman is trying to sit there and celebrate a successful universal title defense, a hard-fought victory against a monster of a man of an opponent. Here comes that glory hog, the real villain in all of this, Jey Uso, to try and steal the spotlight away from the tribal chief because that's what Jey Uso does. And you folks need to realize more and more who the real villain is here, who the real heel is here. Because I promise you, I guarantee you, if you look at the facts and you look at the details, in no way, shape, or form can you come out of this thinking that Roman Reigns is. The evidence clearly points to Jey Uso being the heel and a damn good effective one, the top heel on WWE right now. How dare he interrupt our tribal chief at his moment of celebration and glory? How dare he sit there and not show tremendous gratitude for getting a second consecutive main event pay-per-view payout because of his cousin, because of the familial patriarch that is Roman Reigns. And to top it all off, Roman is trying to tell him that he loves him and he doesn't want this. But Jay just continues to persist. Like a bipolar woman, he just won't drop it. He just can't control his god dang emotions. And Roman even sat there and turned his back and tried to demonstrate and show Jay, hey, I'm giving you trust or the opportunity. If you're feeling froggy, jump. And Jay, to his credit at least, waited until Roman turned around, but then he sucker punched him. So he sucker punches his cousin, then starts whacking him with the chair. When initially all Roman was doing with the chair was trying to demonstrate to his cousin good proper chair hitting techniques and using Braun Strowman in the mat as evidence of that. Now here's freaking Jay Uso. Sitting there sucker punching and hitting his cousin with the chair repeatedly. I'm sorry, who the hell is hearing you heal here? And then on top of all of that, now Roland gets up because he's a fucking tribal chief. And he lays out Jey Uso like a bitch with one punch. Now he's the bad guy. Unbelievable. But a fantastic story that makes sense on so many different levels. It is a connecting, it is resonating. It is certainly the best we have ever seen Roman Reigns. Easily the biggest opportunity that Jey Uso has had in his career up to this point. And he is making the most out of it, by God. Like, this to me has shaped up to be the wrestling storyline of 2020, period. And it's all thanks to our hero, the Tribal Chief, the number one babyface in all of professional wrestling, the biggest star there is today. And that is, of course, Roman Reigns. And remember, I'm the Schlag Data here at OTR Essential. It's not the wrestling show you want. It's just the wrestling show you need because I'll always tell you what's really going on, whether you want to accept it or not. So subscribe, damn it.